We're going to be looking this morning in uh, 1 Peter. We're still in chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verse 13 through verse 21. And um, we're, um, we're looking at a series that's, that I've entitled Exiles. And the reason why is because really the major theme going throughout... Um, okay, I'm trying to open this iPad and Siri wants to have a conversation with me. Um, but... Um, the, uh, one of the major themes throughout the book of First Peter is the fact that, that God's people are called exiles, that we are aliens, that we are sojourners, that, that our citizenship is not here, that earth is not our home, heaven is our home. Our, our, our home is in the presence of God himself. We, we think about, and I'm going to try to get through this quickly because we've got a couple of things we're going to do here this morning as well. Uh, and so, but I want us to really focus in. I want us to think for a moment when you think about someone who's not from a certain country, they can become certain things, or they can become several things. One, you can become an immigrant. An immigrant An immigrant is someone who is not originally from that country, but once they move there, that becomes their place, their nation. They become a part of that country. They begin to take on its characteristics. They become a part. They become citizens. They become all the things that it means to be from that country. And the problem is that sometimes we as Christians that that we get sidetracked a little bit and we lose focus that this really, that really the Bible says that we are pilgrims passing through and we begin to live as though this place is our home and we begin focused on just being comfortable. That we lose sight of the fact that God has called us here to do a mission. And for those of us who are at Southside, and really I think it's a mission that really applies to all churches, that our mission is to do what? To know Christ and to make him known. I mean, it's a, a pretty standard statement across churches that, that what happens is we become, we move to a place where we're immigrants, where we become a part of a country, and then we settle down and we begin to build up our own lives, and that becomes the focal point of our lives. But also, you can move to, or you can go into a different country, and you can be a tourist. A tourist is someone who never really gets involved. They just sort of, you're there passing along, you know, you're just there for a couple of weeks, I was talking to some folks this morning that's been on vacation. They were, they were there as tourists. They were there, spent a lot of time, a lot of money. Now they're home, and now they wish they had another week so that they could unwind from the vacation, right? We've all been there, done that, right? The problem sometimes as Christians is that we also adopt that type of attitude, that we become so separated that we never really get involved, and we never have impact on the culture that God has placed us. We think back to the 60s and the 70s in particular, Christianity almost got to a point that we were trying to build up our own little kingdoms, that we were trying to totally separate ourselves from the world, and we wanted to build a big moat around us so that we couldn't be touched by the evilness of this world. And we separated to such a point that we no longer had impact on the world in which we live. And yet Jesus said that we are to be salt and we are to be light in the world around us. We can't be tourists here in this land and really have the impact that God has called us to do. The, the third thing that we can do is that we can become exiles. An exile is someone who understands that, that really they are citizens of another country, yet they understand that while they are stationed there, that they need to plant their lives where they are at. Uh, later on, I think it's in chapter 2, Peter uses another imagery, an, another imagery that sort of drives on this point, and that is that we are to be ambassadors. Well, what does an ambassador do? And I pause, that means I'm expecting feedback, right? What does an ambassador do? Does he do his own thing? Okay, so, you know, if, if Miss Sue was an ambassador to France, while she's there in France, her responsibility is to speak for the president, right? I mean, she is his representative. The president, regardless of who it is, he can't be all, all things at all times. He can't be everywhere. And so he would send an ambassador to these various countries that would negotiate and would carry on his work there in those countries, that they would work for our nation. We think about this fact that we are exiles, that, that even though we live here, and we're to put down roots to some degree, but we understand that we are here not working for ourselves, but we as believers are working for a bigger kingdom, and that is the kingdom of God, a kingdom that is coming, right? Amen. Even with that Texas shirt, I guess I had just to preach to you. <laughs> Somebody told me this morning they were worried that you were going to offend all the A&M folks here. Just joking at you, Jordan. He's about to go to camp. He's all excited. Yes. You're not supposed to say that like that. He decided what God's going to do among all the youth. He'll miss his wife terribly. And so 
Uh, we are to, <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing that. I don't need to, I don't have time to chase a bunch of rabbits this morning. Um, but anyway, that, that we are, that as exiles that we live here, we're to put down some roots, but again, we understand that we're about something bigger, that we are working for the kingdom of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through verse 21, the Apostle Paul gives us some clear instruction on how we are to live as exiles in a world that oftentimes is hostile toward the king that we serve. I mean, it would be almost like if we were to send you as an ambassador to some of these countries that hate America. If we were to send you as an ambassador to Iran to take up residence. So maybe that's a little bit of an extreme, but oftentimes and we, live in a, we live in a world that we have an enemy, right? Who is our main enemy? Satan. We also, the Bible says that we, we also battle against a culture that by its very nature is in contrast with God's things. God, the will of God, the work of God. But also we, even as believers, we still battle the old nature, the flesh, right, that God has saved us from. But that old flesh still rises up and tries to seek to cause us to drift, to, to move away from the things that God has called us to do. But here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through verse 21, the Apostle Paul gives some clear instructions on how we are to live as exiles in this land. And I want us, we're going to sort of walk through this text this morning I want us to begin in verse 13. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Uh, Peter, writing to this series of churches, writing even to us here today, he says, Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The message this morning really has two main points, but there's a bunch of sub-points underneath them. So, and they don't, they're not any of them really on the screen, so you just got to... Hang with me a little bit here today. As we think about what it's like to, how are we as exiles to live in a land that often is at, is at enmity with God, that's at war against God, the first thing is that we need to live in a state of hope. As we read in, as we read in verse 13 in the English version, the, the, the English translation, it almost seems like there are three commands here. Anybody guess what the three commands seem to be in this text? That we are to prepare our minds, right? The first one, be sober-minded, and then what? Set your hope, right? It sort of seems like there's three distinct commands, but when you really begin to look at the text, there's really only one command, and there's two other uh, subpoints that sort of drive that one command on how you are to go about doing that. The command here is that we are to set our hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When is that? When is the revelation of Jesus Christ? Yeah, at the end time, when he reveals himself, right? The Bible says there's coming a day that there will be a trumpet sound, right, from heaven. There will be a loud shout. The dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive will meet him in the air, right? At that moment, we will see that hope face to face, but we are to set our hope completely on this grace. It's important for us to remember that the word hope here is not used the same way that we often use it. I mean, when we say the word hope, we're often, often talking about some of uh, an emotional feeling that we sort of hope it comes about. I mean, it's sort of a question mark at the end of it, right? That, you know, I hope that my wife is going to be nice to me today. I mean, that's not said with great assurance, but it's sort of a hope. I, I hope it turns out that way, but that's not the way the word is used here. Matter of fact, in Scripture, the word hope is almost equ it's equivalent to the word faith that you almost could say hope equals faith, that it's a belief that it's going to happen, that it's not a hope-so salvation, it's not a hope that everything is going to turn out in the end, but that we have hope that we know that God is going to fulfill the promises that he has made to us. We think about faith. Faith is trusting God in the present. It's, at this very moment, we are trusting in God. That is faith, right? Hope is more future-oriented. That, that we have a faith that it's all going to work out in the end, that God is holding not just the present, but God even holds our future in his hand, that everything is going to move toward the promises that he has made. This is important for us to remember that the believers that, that, that Peter is writing to in 1 Peter, that they're at a point that they're experiencing great persecution. We talked about this last week, that the Roman emperors, in particular Nero, Oftentimes, they would dip not only Christians, but even political opponents, they would dip them in oil or wax, and they would impale them on a stick, and they would use them for candles to light up their gardens. We also know that Christians oftentimes were fed to lion and run over by armies in the Colosseums. There was all kind of things. These Christians were under great persecution, but not just from the Romans, but they were even under great persecution from the Jews. If you don't believe it, read through the book of Acts. 
I mean, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, it seemed like they just followed him every round. It's sort of like I, we have two little Dotsons, and they're yappy dogs. I always swore I would never have a yappy dog, and now I have two of them. If something moves in the house, they go berserk, and they're barking. It's almost like how these Jews were to the Apostle Paul. As Paul is traveling along preaching the gospel, he'd see a great movement of God's Spirit working, and then all of a sudden you'd hear, he'd see these Judaizers, these Jews that would come in, and they'd begin to stir things up. You know, Paul was stoned. He was run out of town. He was beat up. He was arrested. Eventually gave his life for the sake of the gospel. Even Peter, we read about, we talked about last week, that tradition tells us that Peter was crucified upside down because of his faith. And so all these things are going on, all this persecution. And so Peter's commands them to, to set their hope that of, on this hope that's to come is a reminder, it's a command for them to not give up and to not give in because we serve a God who holds the future. Listen, there are times that life is hard, isn't it? I mean, sometimes it seems like, you know, one thing you get through this and then something else happens. And sometimes it just seems to spiral on and on. But the reality is, is that we have a hope and our hope is in God. So how are we to set our hope? Paul says, first of all, that we are to prepare our minds for action. He says that we are to, ha- to get our minds ready for action. The Greek word here is to gird up the loins. Anybody got an idea what that means, to gird up the loins? All right, now, in those days, you know, they didn't have uh, Nike and Under Armour shorts like we have today. The men wore these long robes, right, have a belt around it. It's sort of like to do with this belt is on the pants to keep my pants from falling down. Um, sometimes it look, maybe look nice. But uh, what they would do is they're, if they're about to get busy with work, if they're about to run, if they're about to enter into a battle, they would pull their little robe up and they would tuck it in their belt and they would tighten the belt up to prepare them for the task that is hand. It's sort of like the, sort of the phrase that we sort of use today sometimes where we're gonna, we tell someone they need to roll up their sleeves and get ready to go to work. Y'all understand that terminology, right? To roll up your sleeves. Why do you need to roll up your sleeves? They get in the way. You don't want to get your shirt dirty, right? Maybe. But primarily they get in the, in the way, so you roll them up so that your hands are free to work. And so Paul said, or not Paul, Peter says here that as we are setting our hope on the future of what God has for us, that we are to prepare our minds for action. And, and he refers that, or he used an analogy there to remind us that just as you were, a man would gird up his loins to get ready to go into battle, that we are to prepare our minds for the work that are at hand, the work that is ahead of us. So how do we prepare our minds for battle? First of all, we discipline our minds. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says, not be conformed to this age. I need to take a deep breath. I'm talking too fast. Sorry. Um, when I was at a previous church, they, I had a sound guy that used to hold a sign up. They had the word slow and an arrow going down. Because I'd get worked up and I'd just start talking. Um, so anyway, sorry. We discipline our minds. In Romans 12, 2, Paul says, Do not be conformed to this age, do not be conformed to this world. He says it will be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And so as we think about preparing our minds for battle, of, of getting our minds ready, setting our minds on the things which are to come, we need to discipline our minds. Sometimes that's hard, isn't it? I don't know about you, but sometimes I can sit down and pray and my mind goes everywhere. I'm thinking about all the things coming up to do that day. I'm thinking about the things that I may be worrying about, which worry really is a siren that's saying you need to pray. But so often we get caught up and we're thinking about all these different things. We start reading the Bible and our mind starts wondering. Part of it is we need to discipline our minds to be able to focus on the things of God, to not be transformed by, to not be conformed to the things of this world, but be transformed by renewing of our minds so that we may know what the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God is. And so most of the time, we don't, I mean, obviously most of the time, we really don't need a new revelation from God. Everything that we need to know about God and what God has for our life is found in his word. We just need, to, we need the spirit to help us discern what God is telling us specifically, and part of that is disciplining our minds. But also we need to live according to biblical priorities. So we think about setting our minds on the things of God. We need to to live according to biblical priorities. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. A lot of times we start wondering how we should live our lives. And the sad thing is that so often we, really, we rarely pause and really think about what God's word has to say about how we should live our lives. 
We are driven by culture. We are driven by our desires. We're driven by the opinions of others when really our priorities, the things that should guide our lives should be in God's word as we seek to fulfill biblical priorities with our lives. And then finally, we prepare our minds. We set our minds by guarding our minds from temptation. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the writer of Hebrews says, Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. We think about this race that, again, in the days that, that Peter lived and Paul lived, that, that the men would gird up their loins as they were preparing for a race. Part of what we need to do to, to prepare our minds for the battle that is before us is that we need to lay aside those things that are hindrances, those things that keep us from walking with God. And also we need to, to, to put down those sins that entangle us, that trip us up, that grab us by the legs and keep us on our face. And instead we need to break free from those things. We need to guard our minds from temptation. An idle mind really is a place where the enemy has open reign in our lives, doesn't he? When we're not focused on the things of God, it is so easy to get caught up in temptation and to, do, to, to leave, a, leave the things that God has for us. The other thing that, Paul, that uh, Peter tells us here, if I say Paul, I mean Peter, okay, unless I'm specifically talking about Paul. All right, this means yes. All right. We need to, Peter says that we are to be sober-minded. Being sober-minded is the opposite of being naive. I'm, I'm sort of amazed today at um, our youth and our college and our young adults. As far as the world is concerned, sometimes it seems like they're not very naive, but when it comes to really living life, they are very naive. Missouri's not here today, so I can talk about her. She can't comprehend why I want her to, when she's driving back from Waco or College Station or somewhere she's driving these two-lane roads that are 75 miles an hour with no shoulder, she can't understand why I tell her, I really want you to be home before dark. She has no concept of what that means. Because she's, she probably see this, I'm from y'all probably tell me, tell her. Because she's sort of naive about the reality. I mean, she sees men or women are equal, but she has no concept, and they are equal, but she has no concept that a woman, most women breaking down on the side of a two-lane road is not a good thing, right? And so... Sometimes I think that our children are very, they're very understanding sometimes of the world around them, but they're very naive to their own life, that, that, that there's no danger, that, you know, I'm 22, almost 23 years old, I can do what I want to do, but uh, I won't chase that rabbit. That's just going to go into something. The reality is that we live in a hostile place, don't we? I mean, w- men and women are equal, but we also know that if you look at those who are uh, most abused in society, who is it? It's women and children, right? Not always, but oftentimes that's where it falls. It's men and women. I mean, it's women and children who who oftentimes are abused. We we live in a hostile place, and we did never forget what Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, verse 8. He says that we have an, an adversary, Satan, who is like a roaring lion prowling around looking whom he may devour, looking who he's going to destroy. Listen, we are in a battle. The Bible says that we're in a battle for the souls of people and that we're in a battle for the name of God. Robbie talked about earlier about going on a mission trip in a place where Christians are viewed as being dumb. I don't know the exact word you use. Maybe in, in, unintelligent. Unintelligent. That's probably a better word. Unintelligent. Not real smart. Um, the list go on and on that, you know, we, we believe in fairy tales, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so... Our responsibility is to lift up the name of God, that we are to make much of him. And if, if, we are, if our minds are not prepared, if we are not ready for battle, then what happens is with our lives, we become an embarrassment to God and we dishonor his name. Right? We dishonor the one that we are to be exalting. But also we're in a battle for the hearts and the minds of lost people who, who the Bible says if they, if they leave this world, if they die without Christ... The Bible doesn't say they go to some intermediary place where they get a second opportunity to hear the gospel. The Bible says they are forever cast out of the presence of God, forever and ever, in a place of eternal torment. A place the Bible says that the fire does not die and the worm does not, uh, the, the, the fire is not quenched, the worm does not die. That, that there really is a place called hell. 
And those who are separated from God will be separated from him for eternity. And so we're in the battle for the hearts and the minds of people who without Christ are going to die and spend eternity in a place of suffering. Listen, we must be vigilant in this battle or we will become overwhelmed by the difficulties of life, life or we will drift into temptation. So we need to prepare our minds and we need to be, um, we need to be sober-minded. Listen, as exiles, we are to live in a state of hope, but also we are to be holy in our conduct. We are to be holy in our conduct. I think that uh, one of the things that we battle in the church of America today is that I think there's a, whatever reason, we've, got, we've gotten sort of too cush with God where God is our homeboy, and we've lost sight of the fact that God is God and we are not. And that there's been this, this doctrine that's, permeated the church in America today, this easy believism that we just say a little prayer and we go on as though nothing has ever changed and that we're saved and we've got our life insurance, we got our fire insurance policy and the heavens are our eternal home. And that's not what Christianity is all about at all. When Jesus' disciples became believers, they followed after him. Those who are fishermen, Peter literally dropped his nets and followed after Christ. He didn't walk around dragging his nets. He didn't say, Jesus, when you come back through the Sea of Galilee, be sure and hook up with me and we can hang out together. But there was a radical change, a difference in our lives. And God is calling us as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, that we're to be holy in our conduct. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14 through verse 16, Peter says, as obedient children, do not be conformed, very similar to the, the language of uh, Hebrews and also Paul's writings in Romans. Do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, but as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Peter's second command is that we are to not be conformed to our former place of ignorance. In other words, what Peter says is that, that if we have truly been saved, that we should no longer be seeking to live the way we used to live, but instead there ought to be a change, a transformation in our life that we are to no longer be conformed, but instead we are to be holy in all of our conduct. And the idea of being holy in the same way that God is holy, is that not an overwhelming concept? I mean, when you think about the word holy, it's, it's overwhelming. It's a, it's a big word. It's, a, I mean, it's four letters, but it's, it's huge in its impact. I want us this morning to quickly look at what holiness is, what our response to holiness ought to be, and how we are to obey this command to be holy as he is holy. The first thing is what holiness is. The key word to remember when we, when we begin to try to understand the word holiness is that it, it, the basic meaning of the word is separated. In the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, when God said that we're to be holy as he is holy, the word holy there, there's, there's two different Hebrew words that can be translated holy. Both of them carry the idea of being separated. Here in the Greek, in 1 Peter, again, it carries this idea of being separated. When God told the Israelites that he was holy, what he meant was that he was totally and utterly different from them, that he was unique, that he is one of a kind. Listen, the Bible says in Genesis that we were created in the image of God, but listen, God is not created in our image. God's not like us, but just a little bit different. God is totally and utterly unique. He is one of a kind. And as you begin to read through the Old Testament, every time you see Israel get in trouble, it was because they had forgotten about the absolute otherness of God. They had forgot about the complete holiness of God. And what they began to do is they began to mix God, the one true God, with all these other false gods. They began to worship all these different gods, and they began to give their hearts not to the one true God, but they began to give their hearts and their lives, their passions to the gods who are made of stone, who are made of wood who were dead and could not hear and could not respond. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. It says, This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Listen, God is totally different from us. He is big. He's bigger than we could ever imagine. He is greater than we could ever understand. He is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our lives because he is so much different than us. He was not created in our image, but we were created in his. But also holiness, as we think about being separate, also means that, that he is separated from everything that is impure. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, 
It says your eyes are too pure to look on evil and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. The Bible says in the Old Testament that if a man were to look at God face to face, what would happen? He would die, right? Because we are unholy, that we're impure, that God is separated from all that which is impure. Listen, because God is totally perfect, he cannot tolerate impurity in his presence at all. But to, to me, the greatest display of God's holiness was not in his separating himself from us, but it was in his entering into our world of sin and corruption and taking that sin and corruption upon himself and providing for us a way that our sin would be separated for, from us, as the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west. You want to think about holiness and why God is worthy of our praise and our worship. Think about this. This God who is totally pure in every way that he cannot tolerate impurity, he comes, he takes on human flesh. And he's placed on the cross, not a cross that he deserved, but he put it placed on a cross where he bore the consequence of your sin and my sin. Listen, that is a God who is worthy to be worshipped, isn't it? He is worthy to be worshipped. He put our sin away forever. So what, so what should our response be toward the holiness of God? Peter tells him in verse 15, he says, But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all of your conduct. We think about that, how we are to respond to the holiness of God, that, that we are to allow his holiness to impact how we live our lives. Uh, you know, we think about so often about sin and those things, but I want to talk to you about a couple other things that, that I think are just as important as is, is avoiding sinful lifestyle, but some other things that I think we can say from the positive view that is we think about how God's holiness should impact our lives. First of all, it should impact our devotion to him. Listen, our commitment to him should be at a totally different level than any other commitment. It should be totally different than any other commitment in our life. Imagine this morning, or let's say yesterday, that if, if I came home and I told my wife, I told Becky, that of all the women in my life, she's number one. How do you think that would work? I mean, I've got a list of women, and she's number one. What, what, what do you think that, how do you think that would work out? I would already be beat down, right? I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to preach this morning. I'd be in a hospital somewhere. Um, she's very kind, compassionate, loving, um, totally opposite from me in a good, thing, in a good way. Um, but we think about that, that if, if I were, I mean, if I'm telling her that she's just the top of a list of all these other people, then really what I'm telling her is that you know, I'm in love with a lot of different women, but you're, you're number one. It wouldn't fly in my household at all. Listen, God shouldn't be at the top of our list. You know, so often we say, God number one, family number two, everybody else number three, and then me last, right? Really, we really want to boil that down. It's, really not a, it's not a great analogy because really, God should be on a list all his own, right? I mean, in fact, Jesus said, if we don't hate our mother and father and our family he extended it out that we cannot be his disciple was he saying that we need to literally hate our family not at all he's talking in hyperbole and he's saying that that our love for him should be so unique and so different than anything else that the love that we have for him should be considered almost like hate toward everybody else listen our heart should be totally and completely devoted to him but also as we think about how holiness should impact how we live our lives it also would impact our adoration of him and we think about adoring him how what, what other word would you use to describe that to adore him starts with w and ends with p worship. worship see i try to help you out don't you wish all you all the students wish you teachers would do that sort of spell it out for them but but we are to to worship him we're to adore him on a different level than anything else in our lives Listen, God's holiness should impact our worship. Psalms 47 verse 1 says, Clap your hands, all you people, and shout to God with a jubilant cry. I've had, been in some other churches before that uh, I was told we were supposed to be reverent in church. The sad thing is for them, reverent meant that you're to be bored to tears in church. Why should we be bored? We're, we're worshiping the one true God. We're worshiping the one who's worthy of our life, who's worthy of everything there is in, our, in us, that we need to adore him with all that we have. And that means clapping your hands, clap your hands. If it means giving him a jubilant shout, go for it. 
First Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, it says, God said, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands. That there's nothing wrong with someone lifting our hands. I, it doesn't mean that we have to, but we ought to have the freedom to do whatever it is that God wants to do, as long as we're not being disturbing, right? Now, I've been in some place before where everybody's praying out loud at one time, and it's, and it's loud, and you can't, I can't even come, carry on a conversation and pray for myself. That may be a little extreme. It's to be done in order, but there's nothing wrong with us being exuberant, being excited about being in the presence of Almighty God. Listen, there's not a single passage in the Bible on worship that says that we should stand in a passive manner with a bored look on our face during worship, unengaged. If you find it, you can show it to me. Every passage I've ever read on worship, people are engaged in worship. If they're in reverent in God's presence, listen, what are they doing? They're falling on their face before him in his holiness. They're shouting, they're praising, they're singing, they're dancing. See, Baptists can dance, Jamie. Some can, some can't, right? <laughs> Becky would tell you I'm one of those non-dancing Baptists, but it's not because I don't want to. I'm dancing in my heart. It's just that my feet don't want to move right. <laughs> but what happens is our posture toward worship often follows our heart. We look bored and unengaged because our hearts are bored and unengaged. Worship should impact our lives. We should adore him. And then finally, how, how, we obey, how do we obey this command to be holy as God is holy? Peter tells us in verses 18 through verse 20, it says, For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. And so the question is, how can we be holy? And the answer is found in the question in this passage, who is holy? Who is it that is holy? Who is it that is without blemish or spot? I'm pausing again, right? Who's without blemish or spot? Is it you? It's Jesus, right? And so uh, Peter says here is that Jesus redeemed us. Listen, the Bible says if I were to look, look at God in my sin, I would die. And what Jesus did when he redeemed us, he took my sin upon himself, and he looked in the face of God, and he died in my place. And the gospel can very simply be stated this way, that Jesus in my place. That is the gospel. That is the good news, right? That Jesus died for me. Jesus died for you so that we could be reconciled back to God. In verses 18 through verse 19, we're told uh, all that we need to know about becoming holy. Jesus, again, says that, that he has redeemed us. What does it mean to be redeemed? And I'm, I'm looking for a big theological definition. Just what is the word redeemed? Okay, to be rescued. It, it really has the idea of someone making a payment for your release, for your freedom from slavery. That's the word redeemed, that, that Jesus paid a debt that we could not pay. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. It's a, it's a debt that we can never pay and be made right with God. And Jesus redeemed us by dying in our place. Jesus redeemed us, what did Paul say, from our empty way of life. And what he's saying there is that before Christ came into our life, that our lives were devoid of significance. We, we, you know, I, I remember back early on in my ministry, back in the 80s, um, where, you know, even in the Christian circles, it was the search for significance. That so much of society was based on trying to find what is the significance of my life. And what Peter says here is without Christ... Our life is devoid of significance. It is useless. We need to be redeemed because we are under, the Bible says that we are under the judgment of God because of our sin. That we are under God's judgment. Listen, there is not one person who has ever lived on this earth before God. If God were to say, I cast you out of my presence forever, ever, could at one time could be able to say rightly, it's unjust. You're not being fair. I didn't know, I didn't hear. You go through the long list of all the things that people say, well, what about this person? Listen, no man can stand before God with any excuse. We're without excuse. The Bible says in Romans that God, even the, even the creation cries out that there's a God. But man in his stubbornness, man in his rebellion says, no, I want to do things my own way. I want to come up with my own God. I want to do things the way I want to do them. And God says, listen, if you rebel against me, then you are then you are, you're cast out. You are forever under my judgment. Listen, nothing our fathers handed down to us could save us, right? I mean, even the best that our forefathers bring passed down to us, not one of those things can save us 
from this problem of hostility between us and God, this enmity that is between man and God. There's only one thing that could save us, and it is the death of God's perfect, eternal Son. Listen, it is through Jesus that we receive holiness, not because of our good deeds, but as a free gift of God. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, God has already declared that you are holy. Think about that. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if there's been a time in your life you understood you were a sinner, you cried out to God and asked him to come be the Lord and save your life, the Bible says immediately that God declared you as holy and righteous. It's a free gift of God. It's something that we cannot earn. Peter tells us that but because of this wholeness that's already been attributed to us, that we are to live with an awareness of the preciousness of what Jesus has done for us. And this awareness gives us the motivation to live out the wholeness that Jesus has purchased for us. Listen, if as, if as Christians, if we claim to be Christians and we live totally with disregard toward God and his, what he's called us to do and to be, it means one of two things has happened. One, either we really aren't saved. Or two, it means that we really don't totally understand all that Jesus has done for us. Because Jesus' precious blood that was shed for us should motivate us. It should drive us to want to live lives of holiness. Does that mean that we're going to be without sin? Not at all, right? Not at all. A great example of being motivated by reverence and love is found in 2 Samuel chapter 23. And I'm going to go through this story really quick. I, I, I seems like every week I read, another, read something in the Old Testament. I think, well, that's one of my favorite stories. I guess I just like all of it. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, King David is coming to the end of his life, and he begins to recount some of the exploits of his mighty warriors. There were 33 men that were set aside as David's mighty warriors. These were men who were set apart. And one of the stories that David tells is that he tells about a time where he had been driven out of Bethlehem by the Philistines. And after a long day of travel, David just mentioned to his guys, boy, I sure wish I had some water from that well in Bethlehem. It wasn't that water wasn't available. Water was available where they were at, but it wasn't the water in Bethlehem. It's sort of like whenever you, when you're from somewhere else and, you know, you, you think, man, I sure wish I had my water. I wouldn't say I want my water back from West Monroe because I think it comes out of the lake, and I'm not sure they purify it. <laughs> I just remember it used to be orange in my bath water, so I'm not real sure I really long for that. But you think, I think back to this creek I used to drink out of when I was a kid when we were out squirrel hunting, and we had this place that my uncle had boarded up, and it was a, it wasn't a creek, but it was a um, spring, a natural spring. So the water was always cold, and we'd always drink that. Man, that just, that just sounds good. It wasn't carbonated. It wasn't filtered. It was just pure water out of the ocean, God, I mean, out of, out of the ground that God had brought up. Anyway, so David is, is longing for the water back from this well in Bethlehem. I said I wasn't going to chase that rabbit. And so three of his men hear what he says, and they go, man, I, I love David. And they go back to, to Bethlehem. They fight the Philistines all the way into the city. They draw water out of the well there in Bethlehem. They carry it back across the desert to where David is at. You know what David did? He poured it on the ground. And David said, Lord, I would never do such a thing. Is this not the blood of men who risk their lives? He said, man, you, you risk your life for something dumb. I'm not, I'm not going to reward that. But we think about these mighty warriors, these, these three men who are willing to risk their lives because they love their king. David didn't order them. He didn't command them. They just overheard him say, man, I sure wish I had some water from that well. They went and got it because they loved him. Two things quickly about David's mighty warriors. One, it shows us what total devotion really looks like. These men were totally devoted to David. It also shows us where this kind of devotion comes from. They were devoted to David because David was devoted to them. They loved their king because they know their king loved them. Listen, we think about this. David loved these three men. He loved them enough that he was willing to sacrifice them to give them. But we think about Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. He risked his life not just to get us what we desired, but he, he gave his life for us so that we could be reconciled back to God, that he literally died for us. Listen, Jesus' devotion to us should motivate us to willing to devote our lives to him. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, it says, Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so your faith and your hope are in God. 
Listen, the whole point of Jesus' death and resurrection was so that we might have a personal relationship with God. It wasn't about religion. It wasn't about church. It was about a relationship with God that God desired for us to walk in intimacy with him. And it was because of what Jesus did for us that they would believe in God and that they would find their faith and their hope in God. Listen, Peter says that God saved us so that we might know him personally, so we might adore him, and so that we might have faith in him. I, I want to just close this morning with two questions for I want you to consider and think about. We're not going to have a public invitation here at the end, but at the end I will be available and Jordan will be down here as well if you want to talk to someone about your salvation or you need to have somebody pray for you. But I want to end this morning with two questions. Have you seen the value of Jesus' blood that was given for you? Have you seen the value? Is it precious to you? Is the blood of Jesus precious? That's what the word precious means. It's of great value. It's more valuable than silver or gold. It could not purchase us back from our position of slavery to sin and death. Have you seen the value of Jesus' blood given for you? And then the second question is this. Is the preciousness of his blood moving you to be completely and totally devoted to him above everything else? Or do you find your life sort of being pulled in two different directions where in one hand you're chasing after the things of this world and the other things you're sort of wanting to hang on to God at the same time? The Bible says that's a divided person, right? A person who is not totally sold out. And what Jesus is calling for us today is that we be totally and completely sold out to him. That is a challenge for us this morning. Let's pray together.